Are you in the market for some SAT tips and tricks? Awesome. I'm gonna share with you some little cool snappy things. We're gonna cover everything. We're gonna cover some math, some reading, some writing and language, so you can get an awesome score on your upcoming SAT. My name is Brooke. I've helped coach students to perfect scores on the SAT. If you want more tips and tricks, definitely check out supertutortv.com where we have two online courses for the SAT and the ACT. I've also got a couple of books on the ACT math section and we have private tutoring which you can check out with me or people like me who are awesome. supertutortv.com slash tutoring. Check it out. We also have a free mailing list. It's totally free. supertutortv.com slash subscribe and we'll send you updates when we have new videos and stuff like that if you want tips and tricks in your inbox and other fun cool things. Right? Right. First trick. Stack and add. Though, more technically, I'm going to stack and subtract on this one. Spoiler alert. Okay, how does stack and add work? First, you gotta have a system of equations problem, okay? I'm gonna be doing a problem number 34 from the October 2021 exam, so if you were planning to do that for practice or something, go do it and then come back. Cool. So here, I have a system of equations. Two unknowns, right? X and Y. The majority of the time when the SAT asks system of equations questions, if you can stack the two equations and add them or subtract them together, you can sometimes get to the solution in a shortcut -y kind of manner. And that's what I'm gonna show you guys today. Do you see how what we actually want here is the value of x plus 2y? Notice they don't ask for x, they don't ask for y. I really don't care what either of them are. All I wanna know is what is x plus 2y? That's all I need, that's all I want, cool? So that's scenario number one, is they ask for something that's not the individual variables, they ask for something clumpy. So step number one is identify that you're looking for something that isn't an individual variable. You're looking for like a sum of variables, something like that. So what I might do first is try to stack and add. That would be three plus two is five. Well, that coefficient's definitely not five, it's one. Okay, then I do three minus two. Oh wait, that's one. Okay, let me try to stack and subtract now. So I'm gonna do three minus two is one X, right? Cool, I'm smushing that in. Four minus two is two Y. Beautiful. And then I'm gonna do 35 minus 15. What's that? 20, you say? Oh my goodness, such a genius over there. And then I'm done, 20. You see how I don't have to do anything additional? I literally just write 20 and I'm totally done. Cool, amazing. Stack and add or subtract. So that's trick number one, cool? Cool. Number two, perfect answer first. So one of the tips that I have for you guys is our brains, right? Our minds. We often, as human beings, are very susceptible to something called the power of suggestion. And what that means is if I read a bunch of answer choices, my brain's gonna try to convince me that something that I read is correct, hopefully the first thing that I read because I'm really lazy. And then my brain is not going to wanna go analyze any text, it's just gonna wanna try to pick something based on my common knowledge or sort of what I already have in my brain. And that can hurt you on the SAT because it basically can flip a switch on your brain into its lazy cycle, right? When we approach multiple choice, we kind of turn on our lazy button a bit because it's a lot easier for our brain to be suggested the answers and then just kind of pick the thing that was floating around in our accessible memory, right? And most of the time at school that works, right? Because most tests at school are closed book tests that are testing more than anything identification, not analysis, not synthesis, not nuance, right? But the SAT is different. It's testing nuance. It's testing, do you pay attention to the slightest of details? Can you tell the difference between this or that, right? So you've gotta be extra careful on the SAT and the techniques that you use at school don't necessarily work here. We're not playing an identification game. And so to get your brain away from that kind of identification game where it sees something it recognizes and it's like, oh yeah, 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 I remember a word that kind of meant that. And cherry picking your way to a bad answer. The way to combat that is you do something that I like to call perfect answer first. I'm actually gonna pull this from a piece that's on my online course. So for my online course, I created this passage that's like super extra hard, like harder than any real SAT reading passage. And you can check it out if you wanna check out my online course. By the way, this perfect answer first thing is something that I do throughout the test. Do I absolutely need to do it on every question? No, but I'm never gonna be sure which question I need to do it on because I only kinda of need to do it on the hard questions. In any case, even on the not hard questions, it's a technique that's solid and it works. So that's how I use it. I use it as often as possible. I'm gonna look at this question. It says the first paragraph mainly serves to establish the. I do not look down here, guys. That's not my strategy. That is not my tip. 
my tip is go back up and read and come up with your perfect answer first. What does this establish? Why do we even have this paragraph? What good is it? What is it doing? What's its function? She had scarcely entered the ballroom and reached the throng of ladies, all tulle, ribbons, lace, and flowers, waiting to be asked to dance. Kitty was never one of that throng. When she was asked for a waltz and asked by the best partner, the first star in the hierarchy of the ballroom, a renowned director of dances, a married man, handsome and well-built. Yegorushka Korsunsky. So, there you go. That's the opening paragraph. What does this establish? It establishes Kitty walks in the ballroom and boom, she's got a dance partner because she's super awesome and part of the cool crew. Okay? So my perfect answer is Kitty is part of the cool crew. That is what this establishes. Okay? So that's what I do first. And then I can look at these answers and we'll see if they match up. We have the social acumen of the narrator. And so first thing, always check your people, guys. Be careful. Is Kitty the narrator? No, she's not. I know some of you out there were like, oh, that sounds kind of good because she has this like acumen. I don't know if it's social, but she's certainly one of the cool kids, right? And you were certain to think that's right. It's not right because the narrator is not Kitty. Kitty's the protagonist. Different human beings. Thank you. Cool. Unconventional personality of a character. So I have a lot of students who like this one. They like that word unconventional. We'll come back to it. Basis of a relationship between two characters. That means this is how Korsunsky and Kitty first met. Pretty sure it's not how they met because he asks her to dance and he kind of knows who she is, right? That's kind of the vibe that I get. Status character enjoys. So I know it's definitely about the status the character has. This word enjoys throws a lot of people because you're like, does she have a lot of fun having that status? I know she has the status, but is she enjoying it? Closest to perfect people. Perfect is she's part of the cool crew. Status a character enjoys. She's She's got the status, right? That's kind of the main idea. So I'm leaning toward this. I'm going to talk to you about enjoys in a hot second. But first, unconventional personality of a character. Let's dig into this. Why do people love this? They pick it because it says Kitty was never one of that throng. So it says she is unlike other people. So a lot of my students will see that and they'll say, oh, if she doesn't fit in with a the throng, then she's different. And if she's different, then maybe she's unconventional. If she's unconventional, maybe she has an unconventional personality. Do you see how I hop, skipped, and jumped across a bunch of logical ideas that are kind of related? That is like total death on the SAT. Please do not do that. Okay. All this is saying is Kitty is a cool kid. She's not in the pile of lacy girls who can't get a dance. But that doesn't tell me that her personality is weird or unconventional. It doesn't tell me she's offbeat. I have no idea. Is she an extrovert? Is she an introvert? I really don't know about her personality. There's nothing about her personality. It's just how other people treat her when she walks in the room. That's all I've got. I don't really have her that much. So that's why we can't pick this one. Okay, guys? So we're not going to pick it. Because, da 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 it's status a character enjoys. Now, let's talk about the word enjoys. Here, enjoys means it's secondary meaning, so you've got to be careful on that. Enjoys here means has the advantage of, right? Enjoys has more than one meaning, and this happens on the SAT. They use words that seem easy, and they're not going to mean the meaning that you think they mean. And I know that makes it harder. But enjoys can mean that she takes advantage of, that she has the advantage of, that she has. It simply can mean has. A status a character has? Yes, she's one of the cool crew. Boom, perfect answer. Lines up. We're in good hands, okay? So there you go. Number three, we're going to get into some um, writing and language. I'm going to give you guys a quick transition tip. So spoiler alert, I'm pulling a question from the October 2021 SAT on transitions. We're going to go to section two. So I don't know if this is a tip or trick. It's kind of both. Okay. So we were talking about the power of suggestion on the reading. Power of suggestion also plays into a lot of the writing section because you read things in place. As I always like to say, the most common wrong answer on this section that students pick is the first answer choice because you're reading it in place and your brain wants to force fit that as the right answer because you read it like a sentence and you're trying to make sense of everything as you read. That's your habit. So when we're doing transition questions, and we have one right here, this word here, and this is a short transition, and this works best for short transitions. Here's my favorite thing to do. I scribble out the moreover and then I'm going to write it right here. And then I'm going to reread the sentence without that power of suggestion, guys. And I anticipate what it should be based on my reading, okay? In the 1878 case, ex parte Jackson, Justice, this guy, crucially extended the meaning of papers in the Fourth Amendment to include sealed letters in the postal system, making postal policy a constitutional principle. So here I want, in doing so, maybe even something like thereby... So I'm looking for in doing so, maybe thereby. We have moreover. We have thus, conversely, and meanwhile. So meanwhile, I use when like two things are happening in a cartoon at the same time, right? Like, why are the coyotes over here? And meanwhile, 
you know, the roadrunners over here and they're different storylines happening at the same time. So meanwhile is just not right. These aren't things, two things separately happening at the same time. It's this is what his action was. And in turn, that's what the consequences of this were. Conversely is contrast. It's definitely wrong because these are in doing so, right? Thus and moreover. So let's talk about these. A lot of you guys don't necessarily know how to use moreover. Moreover means here's an additional idea, right? She was a great dancer. Moreover, she had more experience than the other applicants, right? Here's one more reason. So moreover, I used to add additional information. I don't think this is quite additional information. It's in doing so, thereby, maybe even thus, right? Thus, thereby, in doing so, thus. By doing that, this. In doing so is kind of a cause effect, right? If this is cause and effect, thus is kind of cause and effecty. So that sounds pretty good. And thus is the answer here. So a few lessons. One, don't be drawn in by the power of suggestion. Scribble out those transition words. Sidebar it over here. And then focus on the passage and you're going to get deeper learning, right? When we use multiple choice as a crutch, as an identification crutch, we get lazy in the brain and we start to not exert as much effort as we could, right? We want to exert as much effort as possible on this test. So we want to trick ourselves into not thinking it's multiple choice and that will make your brain work harder. When things are open answer, you work harder. Face it, right? Open answer questions are harder on quizzes than multiple choice. Am I right? Usually at school, yeah, it's because you work harder mentally. So I want you to trick yourself into working harder mentally, scribble it out, put it over there. There's my tip trick for writing a language. That's all I've got for today, guys. If you liked these, again, we have plenty more on our online course at supertutortv.com. Thanks for watching, guys. I'll see you next time. Stay cool. Go crush your SAT. And then tell me in the comments how you did.